Hey folks, welcome to this episode of Sound Decisions here on Passion for Sound. This is the fourth and final installment of my interview with Rob Watts. And in this part of the interview, Rob talks about sampling rates and why higher sampling rates are important despite the limitations of our hearing range. He talks about noise floor modulation and why it's so important in our perception of audio and how we're able to separate sounds easily. And then we revisit briefly MQA and other filtering approaches and why Rob believes they're not the right way to filter digital audio before finishing up with a brief conversation around the Chord Electronics M Scaler and the Hugo TT2 and which product would be a better upgrade from a DAC such as the Cutest. So sit back and relax and I hope you enjoy the interview. One of the conversations that comes up often is if we can only hear up to 20 kilohertz at best, why do we need sampling rates that are higher? Now, one argument is obviously <coughs> um, noise floor well, no changes sure. somewhat. Is that sure. all it is or is there more to it? Well, I, I, I wish I could hear 20 kilohertz because yeah, last exactly. time I did a test, I, could, I couldn't hear above 16 kilohertz. Yeah, so like, uh, um, so I, I think 15 kilohertz is my limit now. Um, and of course, it's, it's not about perceiving the sine waves. Mm. It's about the timing. Yes. And we know that the brain can resolve four microseconds. I mean, these are the, the, the worst, the smallest number I've ever seen on any of the tests, four microseconds. That's 250 kilohertz. Mm. So when I'm talking about my filter and transient, we're talking about the timing of transients and how it's reconstructing these, the, the timing of the transients and how accurate that is. And we know for a fact that the brain is running at 250 kilohertz. If we didn't have this problem, we would need to have recordings that were better than 250 kilohertz. In actual fact, <coughs> one of the strange things was that the brain in terms of timing accuracy is much more accurate than four microseconds. Okay. So the four microseconds number comes about from these neurons that they've, mm -hmm. that they've got. And they've actually taken anesthetized cats and removed their skull and probed on these neurons and seen these neurons fire. So we know that, that they actually work at this, this kind of, of, of resolution. But that's not the same as the timbre variations, pitch um, and bass and instrument separation and focus. Instrument separation and focus, we haven't a clue how the brain manages to separate individual mm. sounds out into individual mm. entities. Yeah. And if you have no clue how the brain can do that, and you can't even ask the question, how will we get a computer to process the feed from a microphone and separate the sound of a trumpet and a, and a violin out. How will we get the computer to do that? We don't even, 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 even ask that question, mm. how we go about it. Mm. Um, so if, if we can't ask that question, then you can't say what timing accuracy you actually require because yep. there may be a timing accuracy that is much more accurate than four microseconds that will degrade your ability to separate in, individual instruments out. Mm. And I've actually seen that because um, on the Q-Test DAC, you've got the, um, the white-green filter or the orange-red filter. Mm -hmm. And when you select between white-green or orange-red, you're switching in a 256 um, FS filter, a WTA filter. When you do the measurements on that, they will measure identically the same. Okay. Um, and you, you'll see no difference whatsoever on measurements. Um, but when you listen to those two filters, like the white to the orange, mm. you'll, you do hear a change Absolutely, in sound quality. Yeah. Things sound a little softer. Now, what that's doing is it takes a WTA1 filter, which is the output is about 1.3 microseconds. So you've got a sample every 1.3 microseconds. And then does another WTA um, to reconstruct it so you get an output every 88 nanoseconds. Okay. Now I have that similar filter on my earlier DACs before I had this. So we, we still have a, a filter doing that. It's an infinite impulse response filter. It's like a resistor capacitor, low frequency, low pass filter, still doing the filtering. When you look at a WTA filter against the IR filter, the three stage filter that I had, the numbers are incredibly similar. Mm. And I didn't expect there to be a change in sound quality, but you can perceive it. So even 88 nanoseconds in terms of going from an IR filter to an FIR filter, the FIR filter, WTA filter will be more accurate in resolving the, the timing information. Even that is important. Mm, so nice. we can certainly perceive 
better than 1.3 microseconds. Um, and um, yeah, so so how accurate the timing is, it, it, there's, we might end up being in this state where it doesn't matter how small the timing error is, if there's a timing error or a vagueness in where the timing is occurring, where it's bumping backwards and forwards, that will become audible, right. like we have with small signals. Yeah. At the moment, I haven't been able to put a number on how accurate we need these things to be. Mm. My suspicion is that it could well be, if there's any uncertainty in your timing of transients, even if it's down to 10 nanoseconds, it will still be audible. That, that answers a lot of questions around the, um, the resolution. That's good. Thank you. So um, It kind of also it gives me another reason why you need a noise shaper to be running at, at 9.6 nanoseconds. So my outputs are at 9.6 nanoseconds. I can actually technically reproduce a 50 megahertz sine wave. It's not very good at 50 megahertz, but I can reproduce it. Right. So it's one reason why running the noise shaper at a very high rate, running your analog section at a very high rate, you can improve your reconstruction of transients more accurately. Uh, yes. If we're starting to talk about 88 nanoseconds as being important, then it's very important you have a noise shaper that can resolve these kind of things, mm. which, which means you have to have a noise shaper running at 104 megahertz. Yep. And I'm the only crazy guy on the planet that run audio noise shapers uh, I, I think the highest I've seen is 12 megahertz. Okay, wow. So I'm, so going I'm, I'm nearly 10 times higher than the mm. highest anybody else would do. Okay. Um, and this is another benefit of doing that. It's not just about small signal accuracy, it's about your, your transient accuracy. Transient as well. Okay, makes sense. Um, the, the noise floor, I think we've spoken about a little <coughs> bit. We didn't, talk, we didn't talk too much about noise floor modulation. No, I was going to say, can we, can we talk... So the question yeah, I had here specifically was, why is it so important? So my understanding is that most DACs out there have noise floor modulation, whereas yep. your design of DACs have no noise floor modulation. So the yep. key question is, having now heard the benefits, what's the theory behind why it is so important to not have any noise floor modulation? Okay. So firstly, my... Well, yeah, my, my DACs still do have noise floor modulation. Um, there's certain mechanisms inside the, the, the device. That it, the issue is that it's no measurable noise floor modulation. Okay. Um, and you can have immeasurable noise floor modulation that is still audible. Uh, why is noise floor modulation audible? Well, the first issue, you've got two, two primary issues. You've got, imagine you've got the sound of a, a saxophone. Saxophone is supposed to sound very rich and dark and warm. Um, if you have white noise that is modulating in sympathy with the sound of the saxophone, so as the saxophone increases in level, your noise increases in level, which is what noise floor modulation is, then the brain cannot tell the difference between the sound of your white noise that's saxophone-like and the sound of the saxophone itself. It just mm. cannot separate the two out because they're completely correlated together. Yep. So your warm sounding saxophone has the addition of a bright sounding noise to it that makes it sound artificially bright. Um, so that's one thing on, on your timbre variation. The other issue is that imagine you've got a, a saxophone and you've got a piano. Um, the brain has got to separate those two individual sounds out. Mm -hmm. If the piano is creating noise floor modulation, the saxophone is creating noise floor modulation then the brain has now got four signals to worry about. It's got the signal from the, the saxophone, the signal from the piano, and the signal from the noise floor modulation of the piano mm. and the noise floor modulation of the saxophone. Now, noise floor modulation from a piano from a saxophone is the same. It's spectrally the same. And that makes more confusion for the brain because it then can, it's then got all these extra components it can't deal with. So your sound of your saxophone and your piano becomes merged together. So the okay. sense of instrument separation and focus gets degraded. So whenever I've improved the measurable noise floor modulation, you get two benefits. The timbre becomes more accurate, becomes richer and smoother and warmer. And your instrument separation and focus, how separate each individual sounds, become more tangible and more, more solid. Um, and um, the key that you've got from a measurement point of view is that all DACs that aren't mine 
create measurable noise form modulation. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be very careful when you're doing the test for the, for the noise form modulation because you have to set your measurement equipment so that everything is identical and everything is the same. You just reduce the levels. Right. Um, but if you do that, then you can see on the plots that I've got, there's none of my products from Mojo right up to Dave have any measurable noise form modulation. Okay. But they'll still have residual noise form modulation and that still might be audible. Okay. Based on what we were just talking about before that we don't really yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. And I know that to be the case because um, my issue, I'm trying to make USB sound the same as optical. Optical is your best input to use from a sound quality point of view. It has no RF noise. RF noise is a big issue with noise form modulation. Um, so what happens with, with RF noise is the RF noise gets into the analog electronics. Um, if it's random RF noise, it's at RF frequencies, 10 megahertz or whatever, your analog electronics is non-linear. That creates distortion with your wanted audio signal. The intermodulation products is noise distributed across the whole bandwidth. Mm. So you get a, a lump of noise in the audio bandwidth that is linked to your audio signal and it's linked to your, your random RF noise. Okay. What Rob's talking about here is the fact that if RF noise gets into the system, and RF noise refers to a wide range of different sources of noise and the frequencies that they cover, but importantly, he's referring here to, to frequencies in the range of say 10 megahertz noise. And what he's referring to is the fact that when those very high frequency sounds get into a system, an audio system, an analog system, that is not designed to reproduce those sorts of frequencies, it causes all kinds of issues in the reproduction of the audible frequencies as well. So harmonics and, and non-linearities and distortion, and that's the issue with those sounds. So even though 10 megahertz may sound like it's way beyond what we can hear, and therefore not an issue, it does actually influence the frequencies that we can hear in terms of how the analog stage is able to handle that. And that gives you a noise form modulation. So RF noise being pumped into your DAC is a major issue for creating noise form modulation. Um, and um, as I've improved the sound of my USB inputs to make it sound more like optical, it's been about galvanic isolation, filtering the RF noise from the source, from the corrupting the, the, the analog section. And even though my simplest DACs, like the Hugo 1, had no noise form modulation, when I improved it with Hugo 2 in terms of the USB performance by adding RF filters, you could easily hear the benefits. And it sounded, mm. you know, the same as optical. Hugo 1 didn't sound the same as optical. But you won't see any change in your measurable noise form modulation. So I know non-measurable noise form modulation is still significant. Still, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Cool. And, and, and this is another reason why people say measurements are the only thing that are important is wrong because we can have immeasurable errors mm, mm. still that we can actually we can actually hear yeah and of course the guys that only do listening tests they're also wrong because they're mm. missing out a huge resource of doing measurements of finding things that actually do make a big difference in the sound quality yeah and generally speaking if i see a distortion or a noise signal related it will be audible it doesn't matter how small it is, it always ends up being audible. Mm. Um, and when you reduce that, you, you improve the performance. So yep. throwing measurements away is a bad thing. Throwing listening tests away is a bad, bad thing. You have yep. to use both. Do the two together. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to comment briefly on this because I think it's really important what Rob's saying here. Essentially what he's saying is that our hearing is far more sensitive than we realize and are able to do things that science and the engineering community still don't fully understand in terms of how we're able to separate sounds and process a complex sound wave coming into our brains. So what that means to me is that we need to be really careful with audio that if something can't be measured such as the difference from one cable to the next that we don't write that off as therefore having no impact. It's so important to listen to the different options and make up your own mind. And that's not me saying that one thing's better or worse. It's just about each individual having a chance to hear for themselves because sometimes you can hear what's being measured, but you can't always measure what you're hearing. And so I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind and, and to avoid some of the black and white conversations that sometimes come up in this hobby. A lot of software now has upsampling features built in, whether it's using Rune or J River or the like. Um, based on the fact that your DACs do oversample, um, 
do you recommend that if someone's using good quality software, should they feed your DAX with oversampled files? So should they take a Redbook 4416 file and send it to the DAC as a, let's say it's, if it's 44, upscale it to 88 or 176? Or should they let the DAC take care of all of it? They should let the DAC take care of all of that. Okay. Um, and there, there are two reasons for that. One is the algorithms aren't WTA. Mm -hmm. And the processing power that's available in the PC is limited, unless you're okay. very, very clever and use the, the graphics card. Um, and the other issue is that people, I mean, I am bothered listening to, 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 to these uh, oversampling filters. So this is not based on, on, on my listening test. People that have bought my products and tried um, these um, computer-based systems it sounds a lot worse. And okay. these are people that I respect their subjective opinion. Mm. So, um, yeah, for sure. Particularly like Rune um, or J River, when it's actually a very simple interpolation filter, mm -hmm. if just you'd be crazy to use it. Yeah. But, you know, if, if that's something you want to try, then by all means. Yeah, do enough it, stop do trying it, it out. Yeah. Try it out. It's, yeah. it's, it's your music you're listening to. Yeah. Um, if you want to screw it up, then that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's your option. <laughs> yep. No, it's just nice to hear from the uh, from the designer what the uh, what the preference might be. So now now that I've heard that, I'll actually go back and listen to the both and see what I can what I can hear. That's that's yeah. good. Um, and and there, there was something we could have done, and commercially it would have made much more sense. Um, and that would be to give you, give people a minimum phase filter, mm. a NOS filter option, and loads of other options. And um, we could I could easily have done that. That would have taken no time whatsoever. Um, I'm not in the business of selling DAX. I'm in the business of enjoying music. Yep. And you have to have integrity. If there's something that you know sounds worse, I don't give that as an option to, to, yeah. to people. Um, and uh, that's why I've never done. Um, I've never done the um, adding different filter options. Yep. In terms of minimum phase, it's always been the best I can do on the WTA filter because this is the thing that sounds the best. Yeah, and if you don't like the WTA filter, you've got that option of, of using, um, you know, these, these upscale filters, mm. and you've got the option of not buying buying core products. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, you've you've always got that option. So we, I just realised in talking about filtering and whatnot, we we never touched properly on MQA. You, yes. you mentioned it briefly when we we're talking about the sync function filters and and um, the like. So what is MQA's approach to, um, to filtering and, and why, in your opinion, is it not as good an approach? <coughs> well, MQA, again, is a minimum phase type filter. Um, and it's poor because it's low tap length. Um, and it's poor because it doesn't look into the, into the future. It's only looking in the past. So what they're doing is they're seeing ringing on it and saying pre-ringing is bad mm. and that is a prejudice as I was explaining earlier um, that is just nuts it's because you're not understanding sampling theory correctly pre-ringing is essential to, to be able to reconstruct your analog signal in the ATD converter perfectly um, if you use enough pre-ringing and if it's sync mm -hmm. function um, and uh, the minute you start not looking into the future, you end up with huge transient error. What I might do is use this opportunity <coughs> to jump in and, and make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, when a sound is, is sampled or, or received by the DAC to be reproduced, as well as the impulse itself, there is this infinite number of shrinking impulses forwards and backwards. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yes. So the pre ringing the stuff that happens before the impulse. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, exactly. And, and people look at pre ringing and say, well, that's unnatural because it's happening before the event. Mm. Um, which, which, if it was in the audio bandwidth, it would be true. But the ringing is happening at, for a sync function, it's happening at 22.05 kilohertz, which you can't hear anyway. Mm. And if it was a sync function, and if it was a properly bandwidth limited signal, which digital is supposed to be, then it wouldn't ring anyway because okay. um, it's it, it's only because you're using an impulse that has an output at 22.05 kilohertz that is an illegal signal. 
Mm. It's great to use it so you can find out what your filter coefficients are because what you're getting from that are your filter coefficients. It tells you your performance of your filter. Okay. It's not telling you what the filter is doing to real music and real audio. And the minute you have bandwidth limited, you get better, less ringing with a WTA filter than you will with a minimum phase okay. or a QA type filter. Because they add ringing to it. And it may be ringing after the event, but they're still adding things right. that aren't there. Okay. Source. Now, the, the reason why people like the sound of MQA or minimum phase is that imagine you've got a DAC that's got lots of noise floor modulation in, in it. It's going to sound hard and bright um, naturally because of the noise floor modulation. Um, you want to tame that down. You want to make it sound warmer and smoother. Mm. So what you can do is if you use um, minimum phase filter, your transient errors are huge. Mm -hmm. The brain then cannot detect transients properly and everything goes out of focus. And when transients go out of focus, things sound warmer and smoother. Mm, okay. And the bass gets big and fat and ill-defined. And again, people think, oh, that sounds better because I haven't got a tight bass. I've got a nice big fat bass. Um, but it's all artificial. Mm. Your better approach is to make sure your DAC is fundamentally warm and refined and doesn't have noise or modulation. Then you can reconstruct your transients properly using a sync function. And then you'll get the most hard, sharp sounds without it sounding overly aggressive. Yep. And you'll get the rich, warm saxophone sounds mm. at the same time. Yep. So um, this, this is why on inferior DAX, people could prefer the sound of a NOS filter, which is doing the same thing, uh, or the sound of an MQA or a minimum phase filter. This is artificially softening the sound. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I was going to say that the my experience with MQA is I do subjectively enjoy it. If I'm critically listening, I do find it's not as good. Um, but subjectively speaking, I enjoy the sound for what it is. Probably not dissimilar to what I described at the very beginning of, of our conversation around the Nostax that I've tried and subjectively quite enjoyed. So it's interesting yeah. to say that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's your explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. So I've got one final slightly cheeky question because this is partly personal, but I think it's also going to be interesting to other people. All right. Cool. Somebody out there did have a cutest as an example. So we've got the 48,000 tap filter. My expectation is I already know the answer to this, but would you say they're better off to add an M scaler for the million taps or the Hugo TT2, <laughs> assuming they don't need amplification or anything like that, is it as simple as saying <clears throat> the M scaler has more taps and therefore it will sound better than the Hugo TT2 compared to the Qtest on its own? Yeah, there's more going on than that because, yeah. of course, you, you, Qtest, you've got to have an amplifier um, connected because you're going to be listening to headphones or you're yep. going to be listening to, to loudspeakers. So um, let's... Equalize it. By, so you still were going to have an amplifier even with the, the TT2. It's going it's going into an integrated amplifier. Yes. So you're using the TT2 as a DAC. Yeah. Um, then you'd be better off with the M scaler. Okay. Um, your transparency will be the same. Yes. Well, it'll be it'll will be a little bit better. Um, the the TT2 is more transparent. It's got better noise shapers than, than the Q test. It's got better detail resolution. It's got better components. Okay. It's got better power supply. It's got a better output stage. Blah 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 blah. Um, so these will impact your sense of transparency. Okay. But the M scaler just does something entirely different. Um, yep. and, um, you've got the timbre variation, you've got the pitch reproduction, you've got the instrument separation and focus. You've got the pure damn musicality that you get with the M scaler that you only get with the M scaler. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's so important. So um, I, I think this, there's a lot of conversations on the threads about Dave, TT2, mm -hmm. M scaler. And a Dave against a naked Dave against a TT2 M scaler, you're looking at similar price. And my preference would be to go for a TT2 M scaler. Yep. If that was all you could afford, and that's all you were ever going to afford, and you were going to mm. give up the high fine, you were retiring, and no more money was coming in. <laughs> um, and that would be my preference um, because the musicality and being able to enjoy the music, the emotions, are the most important thing, and you get yep. that from the M scaler. The M scaler, okay. Um, but 
there'd be plenty of people that would prefer the sound of Dave because Dave is so extraordinarily transparent compared mm. to TT2. Even an M scale TT2, it's much more transparent. So some people, you know, really love the transparency. Um, and some people love the musicality, and, and it's really down to you. So in yep. situations where you, you, you've got TT2 headphones against the Q-Test headphones, um, you're going to get a much, in, in Q-Test with somebody else's amplifier, yep. you're going to get a loss in transparency by using that, that other amplifier. Mm. Um, it, it would be a different, you know, maybe the transparency thing become, comes to mind. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we are we are getting lots of people, Q test owners, upgrading to to the um, the M scaler. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely the path I'm I'm investigating is whether to do the M scaler first or because TT two is ultimately on the wish list. Um, right, that's why I was curious, and I think the answer you've given is really interesting because it's about what each one offers. So the transparency on one hand, and the improved noise shapers and componentry, power supply, etc that's not always evident when you first look at the products and you go, oh, hang on a minute, I can have the mm. cutest sitting here with a million taps by adding the M scaler, why would I go to the TT2? That's a nice, a nice explanation of which one you might choose when, so that's really helpful. Cool. Fantastic. I think we've uh, exhausted your time. We've exhausted my list of questions. Thank you very much for sharing your time. I, I appreciate it, and I'm sure I know based on some of the comments I've had from people on the YouTube channel saying um, you know, so, certain questions that I've written back and said, wait up i've got this conversation coming so i think it'll answer the question so i know that we oh, appreciate That's good. it so thanks very much yeah. for your time um I and it, you... it looks like there's going to be a, another melbourne show next year with um, um... with stereonet again yeah stereonet that's the word i was trying to find. <laughs> fantastic excellent well if you come out I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you then and uh yeah maybe I, have I, 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 really, I really enjoyed the melbourne show actually yeah it was it was a good one Excellent. Oh, good to hear. Good to hear. Well, if you do come out, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you there and maybe have a bottle of wine to say oh. thank you for your time today. All right. No worries. Fantastic. Thanks Cheers again, Rob. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.